Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Maximize Your Variant Knowledge Using the Human Gene Mutation Database, HGMD Professional. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Kyogen. To learn more, visit kyogen.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Ruth Burton, PhD, Field Bioinformatics Application Scientist, Kyogen Digital Insights. Dr. Burton, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, my name is Ruth Burton, and I work for Kyogen as a Clinical Application Specialist. And today I'm going to talk to you about our database, um, the Human Gene Mutation Database, and how it can help you to understand and interpret the variants that you have. So what is HGMD? Well, a good way of answering that question is in the statement below. So does this human germline mutation cause disease? And if that's the sort of question you're interested in answering, then HGMD is a very good place to go. And this database is an expert curated database of human germline mutations. And all of these mutations come from peer-reviewed published journals. And we have a saying at Cargen that if it's not published, it's not in HGMD. So an important point to note is that this database contains germline mutations only, no somatic mutations. And one of the things we pride ourselves about this database is that we use expert curation to ensure the highest quality and consistent consistency of all the information we have contained within it. So just to give you a brief history of HGMD database and how it was developed, this was originally established by professors David Cooper and Michael Koratz, based in Cardiff University. And initially, it was intended for the study of mutational mechanisms. And data was sourced from a range of peer-reviewed scientific and biomedical journals. And the original public version contained about 10,000 variants across 600 genes. And this was, and still is, made freely available from Cardiff University. And I'm going to show you that later during our demo. And this has been available since 1996. But quickly, this database expanded to become the sort of main database for any mutations that cause human inherited diseases. And our current version, which is now the 2021.1 version, and this is of our professional version, contains over 3 million variants in nearly 13,000 genes. So we've gone a long way since 1996. Now, back in 2016, Cardiff University entered into a commercial partnership with Kyogen, and we've become the distributor of HGMD professional ever since. Now, because we've got these two different terms, HGMD, which is almost an academic free database, and HGMD professional, then I'm going to show you both through both of them throughout the talk and throughout the demo so that you can understand the differences between the two. Now, there's lots of different uses for HGMD, and I'll sort of go through these one by one and again show you some of them in the demos later. There's a simple way you can use it. You can just have a variant that you're interested in and you can look it up and you can search by your HGVS nomenclature, by a dbSNP identifier, or just by a chromosome, chromosome or location. And this will show you whether your variant's in HGMD, and particularly this is used for when people are interested in detecting variants or understanding variants that are in rare diseases. Another simple use case for HGMD is if you've got a particular gene of interest. 
And again, I'll demonstrate this in a moment. And this is where you can search for a gene by its name, its description, its location, or even the transcript or omin entry. You can also use sort of a phenotype search as well to help you understand your gene in, in a bit more detail. And I'll go on to show you that again a bit later. And this is an ideal tool to, or an ideal way to really understand the mutational landscape within a gene and whether the new mutation that you found is perhaps in a, in a hotspot contained within that gene of interest. Now, if we're thinking of a, perhaps a bit of a broader application, Another option is actually to use HGMD for panel design. And this is where perhaps you're interested in designing perhaps a panel for your sequencing experiments and you want it to have genes that are relevant to the disease that you're working on, the type of patients you have in your cohort, or perhaps a range of clinical symptoms that your patients might have. And I'll go through perhaps a few examples of this, but really, if you're interested in panel design, you're most likely to be doing those phenotype searches or gene, or gene searches, just to come up with those genes of interest. Another and perhaps less sort of commonly discussed use case is to help, help um, you improve either your um, um, bio, own bioinformatics pipelines or perhaps to improve sort of a, a machine learning model that you might be developing. And these sort of use cases typically use the downloadable version of our database. So the one I'm going to show in the demo is our online version, but we also have a downloadable version as well where all the different searches that I'm going to show you can actually be downloaded as tables that you can query and integrate yourself into your own application. Um, and I've got a few examples um, in a couple of slides time where we can discuss sort of the advantages of using HGMD in that way. A final example that we have, um, particularly here in the UK where I'm based, is um, Genomics England use HGMD to help them understand the variants that they've come across um, during their large scale population screening program. And this is where, they, again, they've been using the downloadable version of HGMD. They've integrated it into their pipeline and they're really doing a combination of tying together, searching for genes, mutations, phenotypes, and actually having a much more high throughput approach to understanding the variants that they're seeing. And this is particularly important when you're um, working on you know, a large number of samples and you've got a lot of um, variants that you want to understand in, in one go. So this table just shows you a few different examples of how HGMD can be helpful. And I'm hoping that during the rest of the talk and during the demo that I'll provide a few more um, points that perhaps will help you in, um, in your um, studies. So just to go into a bit more detail about why um, um, uh, machine learning isn't and artificial intelligent ways of creating databases aren't really perhaps um, useful as they might seem on the surface. And why actually having a team of expert curators um, like we have at HGMD to actually um, input the information into our database can be beneficial. Now, the first point in my table, the speed of curation, is definitely where machine learning or artificial, or artificial intelligence methods win out over expert curation, because expert curation is definitely slower than doing it in an automatic process. But when we actually look at the quality of the data that our experts curate, this is far in excess of something that's an automated process. And that's really because you actually have PhD or um, MD qualified people reading the original publications and following a very strict protocol for curation. And so the quality of the data that they extract from the publications is really highly um, improved and more consistent than something that's just extracting things automatically from a published piece of information. Now, because we've been able to really ensure the high quality of data that goes into HGMD, this means that there's a much lower level of noise in the data. So this means if you search for something in HGMD, the result you get back is going to be accurate, and you're not going to have to look at those search results and check that they make sense. 
we've actually been able to identify some published errors in pieces of literature. And a common example of this is where we've corrected some of the HGVS nomenclature errors that we found when we've been reading and curating these publications. Another way that we've been able to really ensure that we can um, improve the quality and reduce the noise in the data that we have in HGMD is to normalize to a specific gene model. And this means that it allows us to compare across different, perhaps, genome builds or information from different sources and make sure that when we're talking about a mutation, we're always talking about the same mutation. So if that mutation is mentioned in different publications, we know it's the same one. And that again comes back to that thought about reducing the noise in the data is you don't want to return a search, think, oh, wow, this been variant's been seen loads of times before, and actually find that it hasn't. These are just errors in how the curation process has been, been done. And thinking about errors, we can also minimum, minimize some of the artifacts that can be seen in mutational databases. And um, one example here is where we, we found a, a variant that had um, four possible predicted mutations, and we were able to verify the correct mutation and make sure that was the one that was added to the database. So we found that there's lots of um, ways that having HGMD expertly curated really helps and we've also found that having the downloadable version can actually help if you are interested in using a machine learning approach or an artificial intelligence approach, approach to your own pipeline that having that downloadable version of HGMD and incorporating it in that can really help. Now I've mentioned that there's two versions of HGMD the public version and the professional version. Now, apologies if the text on this is a little bit small, but um, I think the take home message is that there's quite a lot of ticks on the professional version and slightly less ticks on the public version. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is in the top half of the table, in fact, of both tables, you can see that the features relate to searching. So you can search in both. You can search in the public version and you can search in the professional version. And that's really what we want to enable with any database, is it's got to be easy to search. Now, in the professional version, you get slightly more ways of doing your, your searches. So you can search by, for example, references. You can search by chromosomal location. You can search by RefSeq transcript. So there's more ways of getting that information out in the professional versions. But both versions allow you to search. The other main difference, and this is now where I'm looking at the second table, is in the sort of information you get out and how it's sorted. In the professional version, we tend to have a little bit more flexibility. So you can sort your mutation by location. You can sort it by phenotype. You can sort it by author. And you could even sort it by the year in which a publication was presented or published. So both versions are really helpful but there's different, different levels of information available in both. And hopefully during the demo, I'll try to clear up some of the potential misunderstandings between what you can do in either and show you the differences between the two. Now, let's talk a little bit about how um, the HGMD database categorizes mutations. So, in H, both in HGMD Professional and in the academic version, our mutations are categorized into the following classes. So, I'm starting at the top of the slide and I'm looking at the first category, which is the disease causing mutation. And this is perhaps the most interesting category because this is where we know that a disease, sorry, a variant is um, causative of a particular disease or disorder. And we have evidence for that in published literature. The second category, and working clockwise around the circle, is where we might have a likely disease causing mutation. And this is where there is some evidence, but perhaps slightly less concrete, that the mutation is causative for a disorder. And then working around the circle, we might have an in vitro or in vivo functional polymorphism. We might have a disease associated polymorphism. And we might have a disease-associated polymorphism with functional evidence. 
or we might have a variant that is a frame shift or truncating variant. So as you can see, a lot of effort has been taken has been placed into actually categorizing those mutations. And so particularly when you're looking at the professional version, you'll be able to see at a glance the relevance of the particular variant that you're looking at. So let's expand on those variant classes in a bit more detail. So as, as I said, the disease causing mutation is where we actually have literature evidence of that variant being causative. The slight question mark is where, again, when we've been reading the report, the author has indicated that there may be some degree of doubt. Now, I think this category really highlights the advantage of having a person reading the paper rather than a machine learning algorithm, because this is where you can actually interpret the text that the author themselves have written and actually help their, their judgment to be moved in and help us to populate that in our database. Now, one of the var variant types that I didn't talk about in the previous slide is shown at the bottom of this slide here. And that is shown by a gray um, R symbol. And this is where we're able to retire variants from HGMD. So while our database grows over time, we do review the content and make sure that if we find an erroneous entry or just that um, the record has become obsolete, we are able to retire that variant or that entry. And so we're able to ensure the quality of the database as it develops over time. So in the next few, few slides, I'm going to show you some screenshots of HGMD and show you some of the search capabilities. So here we can see that we can search by Gene Simple. And in the lower portion of the screen, you can see the HGMD professional option. And I'll show you that live in the demo, so I'll, um, I won't highlight too many, too many um, sections here, but just to say that the gene search option is available in both versions. When you do get the results of your um, gene search in the public version, you get um, uh, just you know, the gene symbol, you can see the chromosomal location, you get a description of the gene name, and you can um, uh, see the um, transcript ID. In the professional version, you will see um, an expanded version of the gene symbol. So perhaps if there's alternative names that, names that the gene is also described against, and you get a more in-depth gene description. And you're also able to link out to RefSeq. So again, slightly more expanded possibilities in the professional version, but you get results returned from both from your gene search. When you um, uh, click on the results of the um, uh, gene view search in the public version, you can see the mutations and how they've been categorized. And you can click on a link to get more details on those mutations. And I'll show you that live, which I think will make a little bit more sense. In the HGMD professional version, it's very similar. But remember, this is a slightly more updated version, so you tend to get more mutations returned. And you also get their class as well. So you're able to see straight away the impact of your variant or the variance in a particular gene. And in this case, um, as shown in the slide at the bottom of the screen, you can see the number of variants that are actually disease causing. Then when you actually view the results here, we can um, see in HGMD Professional the um, uh, sort of breakdown, if you like, of, of the results. And you can see the um, individual pieces of literature that have been curated. You can also see um, the phenotypes. And you're able to see um, where um, the different um, 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 uh, where the protein is often located. So it's almost it's like it's cellular location and um, it's sort of ontology type. So again, you get results from both the public version and the professional version. But if you're using the professional version, then the granularity of the information returned is greater. 
Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you can search by lots of different terms in HGMD. And we've looked in detail about the gene level search options, but you can also make a very specific search and look at an individual mutation. And if I was thinking about HGMD and the database, I would say that the mutations themselves are really the cornerstone of the database and all the information links to that this mutation page because that is what we're interested in, is understanding the mutations that we have in our sample. So when you get down to the mutation page view, this is where you're looking at the core of HGMD. And whether it's in the public version or the professional version, this is where you're really able to understand the impact of the mutation, not only at the gene level, but also at the functional level as well. And when we come to the come to the live demo, then I'll show you how pieces of information within this view really help you to understand the, the potential impact of your mutation. And we can see some of that information now in this screenshot from the professional version. So you'd get a full list of all the references where this mutation has been um, published. You'd be able to see lots of variant details and link out to resources such as the UCSE genome browser. You can also see the variant in different genome build versions. So you could convert your variant to HG19 or to HG38. And this really helps because often data has been built up over time and might have been annotated against different genome builds. You can also see information about the amino acids um, within the gene of interest where, from where your mutation sits. And this is really valuable for when you're trying to understand the impact that the mutation has, not only at the gene level, but also at the protein level. And so we can see in the table in the bottom right hand corner, a list of um, sort of a, well, a pilot really of all of the amino acids um, across different species. And we can see where your mutation sits and we can see how that region has been conserved across these different species. And this sort of alignment can help us to understand the potential impact of a mutation occurring at that location. In the lower left-hand corner, we can see some results of the in silico prediction tools. And these are helpful, again, for, in, for um, understanding the impact of the mutation at the um, protein level, but also if you're interested in classifying your variant using the um, ACGM classification criteria, many of those rules rely on in silico prediction results. Now, as I said, we can also search by mutation at, um, at, uh, at that level as well. And um, an easy way would be to use the HGMD accession number if you know that. When we come to the demo, I will show you a few different options for searching here for your um, the mutation that you want. And one of the, um, the ways that I quite like doing it is even just to search and browse for different mutations, perhaps if I'm particularly interested in, in looking for um, um, new mutations that have been added recently or for looking at particular phenotypes. But we'll go through those in the demo so you can see how this screen would work in, in a real situation. Now here we see a screenshot for phenotype searching. This is again a really useful tool and it allows you to actually understand um, what genes might be related to a particular phenotype and where if you're interested in a particular um, type of disease or you have patients with particular um, disorders, in this screenshot we're seeing um, hearing loss as, a, as an example, then you can use that as a search term to actually find genes that are related or where we've seen um, uh, mutations that occur in those genes that then cause or impact um, those clinical phenotypes. And this is a great way if you are interested in making a very um, tailored panel to find those genes that are relevant to the phenotypes you're interested in. Now, again, I'll hopefully show you this section in the demo, but you can also search by reference. So if you wanted to check for a particular um, publication or if you just wanted to see if a particular publication contained any other mutations, this would be the best way to do it. Is you can search by the name of the author, you can look at PubMed, 
you can even, as I said at the very beginning, look at the year in which the journal was published. So again, it's a good way to start to build up a picture about um, variants or genes that you're interested in and to start off at the at the publication level. And I think this um, also um, helps us to understand exactly how HGMD was created. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, it's sort of cornerstone is looking at those mutations, but we get that information from the literature. And so you can begin to see how all of these different sources tie together by um, doing a few literature searches and, and understanding the breadth of information that's contained within HGMD. Now, one of the search mechanisms that I find most useful and I think is commonly being used now is the batch search. And imagine you're in the situation where you've um, done some sequencing and you um, have got a VCF file containing a list of variants, but perhaps you're interested in understanding a rare disease that you've not seen before and you haven't really got much uh, clin men, many clinical details about the about the sample and where it came from. One of the things you can do is just upload that VCF file into the professional version of HGMD. And again, fingers crossed, I'll show you that in the demo. But that allows us to then just look at those variants, search within HGMD, and see have you seen that variant before. And then from then there. Fingers crossed, you'll be able to understand more about the variant and then more about the patient and the sample from which this file came from. Um, and so this, as I say, is a really great way to really home in quickly and identify those key important variants. Because obviously, if a variant's been published before and it's in HGMG, then that's going to really help you speed up your understanding of that result. And another tool that's also useful is our advanced search option. And this again is um, just available in the professional version of HGMD. And I'll again show you this during the demo. And this allows you to do something really simple like put in a gene name and then see all of the variants that are contained within that gene broken down by their literature, um, their original literature source, by the mutation type and uh, also to see the impact of those variants. And I think, um, again, when I have done this search, this really helps me to um, understand um, the range of mutations that are present in a, in a particular gene. So now I've talked a lot about showing you some of these features in um, a live situation. So I'm going to pause here and then switch to the um, live software. Um, so I think I'll finish here for a few moments. So you should now see on my screen the two versions of HGMD that I've been discussing during the slide part of our presentation today. So at the, currently, this is HGMD Professional, and we've also got the free academic version of HGMD. So as promised during our earlier discussions, I said I'd show you some of the ways of using HGMD and the different search options that um, we have available um, live. So I'm going to give that a go now. So I'm going to start off with doing something very simple. And that is just searching for a gene. So I'm going to paste in a gene here. Oops. And I'm going to search for gene symbol. And I'm going to press go. And as, as we would have hoped, as we would have expected, we get a result returned. So we get the gene symbol again, we get the gene description, and we get its location. If you wanted to find out what mutations were present in this um, gene, we would need to click on this hyperlink, and that would take us to the um, sort of the overview page where all of the mutations are listed out. And so here we can see in TGFB3, we have 19 mutations and they're divided into different categories. So we have missense or nonsense mutations, splice mutations that fall into splice sites, mutations that fall into regulatory um, regions, and then four um, variants that are small deletions. And we can get these mutations by clicking on these links here. But before I actually start looking at these mutations, let's compare the result that we've got in the academic version with the same search 
in the professional version. So I'm going to go to the gene section of HGMD or the gene section of the online version of HGMD and I'm going to put in the same gene and I'm going to want to have a gene summary so I'm going to submit my query. And we, in this instance, get taken straight to a very similar looking page as we've just seen in the academic version. But here we can see we have 51 mutations being returned instead of, in the academic version, 19. These 51 mutations are again broken down by the different types of mutation, but also in this instance by their variant class. So we, can, we talked a lot about this during the presentation, so here we can see we've got 30 variants that are disease causing and 21 variants that are likely to be, to be disease causing. And we can click on those by clicking on those links. But let's switch back to the um, academic version for a moment and actually look at some of these mutations in more detail. So here, for example, I might be interested in these two mutations that fall into the splice sites. I can click here and I can see those mutations in a list. So there I can look at the two mutations, I can see the phenotype that they're associated with, and I can also view the references. So the actual primary source of information that was used to add this piece of information to the knowledge base. If I'm in the professional version, I can also look at those six, well in this case we've got six mutations, and I can see them listed out. I've got the HGMD accession IDs, I can see the HGVS nomenclature, and I can also see the variant class. So that's really helpful because I can see which variants are likely to be disease causing and which variants have been, have, for which we have evidence that they are disease causing. I can see the reported phenotypes, and again, I can see the literature. We also have this extra information column um, present in the professional version. And this can be really helpful because it, for example, it does vary a little bit by variant to variant, but here we can see the um, uh, location for HG38, the location for HG19, and here we can see that this variant has been classified as a VUS according to the ACMG classification criteria. Um, again, you know, other variants will have other pieces of information. Here we've got a link to an entry in dbSNP, and here we've got um, uh, a sort of a comment where we can see that this is an exon 4 um, skipping event or causes an exon 4 skipping event. We can also click on any of the links in more detail to actually go and look at those mutations in more detail. So if I wanted to look at this top mutation, I could just click on here and that would take us to the mutation entry itself. And so this is a really, um, you know, um, good um, part of HGMD to be looking at because it really is a sort of the core fundamental um, part where you can see any extra information available. Um, you can link out to UCSC Genome Browser um, and you can see more details about the variant. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail when we start to move on to the next searching option. And that is really to use uh, the um, the way that the mutation has been described to search for it. Now, if you had the accession number, you could go straight to here and search for a mutation, but you could also search by its HGVS nomenclature. So let's try that. Let's copy that in and make sure we switch to say that we're searching by HGVS and then submit our query. So here, obviously, this nomenclature is used across a range of valid across a range of different different type um, different gene types but here we can see that mutation in TGFB3 and again we can start linking out to the mutation result and this is for this um, mutation we've got a lot more information available so we can actually um, not only see the variant and where it sits in the reference sequence so we've got the reference and alternate alleles being displayed here we can also see um, uh, some of the other sections that I was discussing with you on the slides earlier. 
So here we have an alignment of all the amino acid sequence. And this is particularly important because we can see the conserved how, how conserved the region is around the mutation. And this can help us to understand how um, what the impact of such a mutation could be and whether um, it falls in a very conserved region. And this is across a range of different species. So here at the top, we have humans. And further down, I think this must be an alligator. And we've got cow and and so on. So again, a really nice additional piece of information. As we were looking at in the slides, on the left hand side, we have the results of in silico prediction tools. So here, oops, we've got SIFT, we've got Polyphen, you can see mutation, taste, mutation taster, mutation accessor predictions. Um, and we've got the results of the, uh, things like the CAD score. And these, as I, as I think I mentioned in the slide section earlier, will be really useful if you were trying to um, sort of classify your variant following the ACGM criteria. So this is the mutation page. And almost this is like the primary um, piece of information. So sort of the end point of most of your searching. So while you can um, search on the gene level, and on the mutation level, it's this part of the software that you're really aiming towards. And most of the pieces of information will link back through that identifier um, to this to this endpoint. If you wanted to do a bit of a more broader search, perhaps you didn't have a gene of interest and you didn't have a mutation that you're interested in, but perhaps you were more interested in some of the clinical phenotypes or symptoms that um, a patient might be exhibiting, then it's also possible to use those in HGMD as search terms. So here, if we go back to the academic version, we can switch from our gene level searching to our disease and phenotype level searching. I can type in a phenotype and I can click go and it lists out all the genes that we have in our database, in HGMD database, where there is a link between the gene and the phenotype. So if I wanted to make a short list of genes where there was an association, association between the gene and bifid ovula, this would be a good way to do it by using the phenotype search. We can do a similar, similar type of search in the professional version. So let's go to the phenotype section and type in the same phenotype and see what type of results we get. So make sure we switch to phenotype and click submit. Again, we get a nice list of genes out. We can see how many mutations there are in each gene. So we can see this MET um, S2 um, gene would be a good one to choose if we were making a panel because it's got quite a few known mutations in already. And we've got an extra gene. So this um, F FBX011 gene wasn't present in our academic version. So this has probably come from a recent addition to the database. So again, we could be thinking, I'm interested in a certain phenotype. Let me find out from HGMD what genes might be associated with it so that I can go on to make a panel. But perhaps you're not interested just in like one phenotype. You might be interested in a range of phenotypes. And we can search for more than one entry at a time using the phenotype search. And one of the nice things, and I'll show you how this works, is that you're able to use um, Boolean um, operators. So here I'm typing in five different phenotypes and I've prefixed all of them with the plus symbol. And this means that I want to find or I want to see if there's an entry that contains all five of those phenotypes. And so this is a very specific search and I'm expecting to get a very specific answer. And, and as you can you might expect that's what I do get. I get one result and I can see that there is one mutation in TGFB3 where all five of these phenotypes are present. So that's a very specific way of searching. I might be thinking of something a bit broader though, and I might be thinking, well, I am interested in all of those five phenotypes, but I don't need them to be all contained in the same case or in the same gene. I, I might have patients where they have these phenotypes, but they might have other phenotypes as well or only contain a subset of them. So again, I'm using the same five search terms, but this time I'm putting them in inverted commas. And so I'm looking for instances where any of these five occurs. 
So this is almost like the complete opposite. This is a very broad way of searching for phenotypes in HGMD. And so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, to get more than one result. And actually, I do. I get 855 results. So here, there's a very big list of genes that could be related to those five phenotypes. And they've all been searched for as individual terms. So when you're using the phenotype way, you can do either a very specific search by a single phenotype. You can do a very defined search by using the Boolean operators and combining multiple phenotypes together. Or you can search for any phenotype combination that you're interested in. And there's also a different way, another way of using the phenotype searching, and that's just to browse them. And so you might have perhaps guess that uh, a lot of the phenotypes and genes that I'm interested in during this demo are, to, are associated with the lertz ds syndrome. So I could just think, oh, let's see if, let's see what's, what phenotypes we can, and genes we can see in, in HGMD for lertz ds So I can browse by all of them for the letter L, and I won't go through all all 12 of the pages, because I do know that the ones I'm interested in are on page eight. And here I can see all of the lertz ds syndromes listed out here. And this is, I, I thought this was quite a nice view because you can see how it's been described in different ways. There's lots of different types of lertz ds There's some with marfan light syndrome, and there's some with other things like this ulcerative colitis. So there's quite a broad range of different phenotypes that are contained within the broader context of lertz ds Now, I can actually search for, search for diseases in both versions of the software. So I can go back to my um, academic version. I can look at lertz ds and I can say disease or phenotype, and I can click go. And that gives me a nice list of genes and phenotypes. So if I wanted to make a targeted panel or perhaps a virtual panel from whole exome or whole genome sequencing, where I would just target the genes that are known to be associated with lertz ds this would be a good list, a good short list of genes to start with. I can also do something very similar in the professional version. And so I'm going to, again, just type in my disease. I want to look for phenotypes and I'm going to click submit. And then we get a very similar list. But you can see that we do get more information from the professional version. So you can actually see the number of mutations that are associated here. And so we can start to get a feel for the real key genes that should be on the, on the panel and ones that we might want to investigate further. Um, but again, both the academic version and the professional version are both good for searching at the phenotype level. So we've had a look at searching sort of at the gene, the mutation, the phenotype level. So instances where we know something about the sample that we're or the type of samples that we're interested in. Another way of searching in the um, professional version of HGMD is to um, search by reference. And you can do a very simple search if you've just got an author that you are interested in. You can just add this to the search field search all fields and submit query and this gives us this paper again we can see in in this view that this paper contains a key variant a disease causing variant and i think when you're looking in um, hgmd we always have to think that that is the key piece of fun the fundamental piece of information is that mutation and um, the impact it has and we keep coming back to this so again we can go back here we can look at that HGMD accession ID and we can look at the mutation that has been described in that reference. One of the nice things about searching for references is that you can also see how many um, um, publications are actually, um, how many times a, a variant has been listed in an individual publication. And so you can sort of check that variants um, aren't being double counted if you want to look at sort of frequency of occurrence. So here we can see that this instance is a primary literature report. Um, it's again, a very nice, nice way of, um, you know, being sure that we're confident that we know um, what we're actually viewing. At any point, any of these links, so if we wanted to go back and see if there are any other interesting references associated with this gene, we could go back 
and look at the gene level information, which is shown here. So, and one of the things I perhaps forgot to mention earlier about the gene level um, description is that we can also see, find out a little bit more about this gene and where, what it's in, where its involvement is, is we can actually see um, the um, location and the go terms associated with what this gene is involved in. So um, if we wanted to sort of think about the types of clinical phenotypes we are looking at or what pathways might be involved in, this um, section here at the very bottom, this gene ontology for TGFB3 can also be um, really helpful. So it's worth when you're looking at um, HGMD, not just to um, focus in entirely on to the um, mutation level information, but also if it's a gene that perhaps is a bit new to you, to look at the gene level information available that's available as well. So we've sort of looked in quite a lot of detail about these first three options and the reference option. Now we're going to move on to one of my sort of more favourite sections of HGMD and one that I use most frequency, frequently, and that is the batch option, batch search option. And the reason I use this a lot is because um, I often tend to be finishing my secondary analysis and I end up with a um, uh, after doing all my sequencing work, and I end up with a VCF file with a list of variants in it. And what I really want to do is look at those variants and decide which ones are interesting. And perhaps I don't know much about the patient, and perhaps I don't know what genes I might be interested in, but I do know that the variants are of interest. And so what I can do here is I can simply select, and I have to make sure I get the genome build correct, and I can choose my file and I can select here my VCF file and I can just upload the list. Now, this will then take, and I think in this file there's about 60, yes, 61 different variants. And I can see that most of them are not in HGMD, but this one is. And again, as you, you know, we're coming back to this TGFB3 gene again, um, and this is the variant that I'm particularly interested in. And I can see that straight away, this is my disease, a disease cause invariant now 61 isn't too long a list to have to to have to um, scroll through but I can decide to prioritize my list if I couldn't be bothered to scroll right down to the bottom because here I'm viewing this with no prioritization so let's prioritize my disease causing mutations and reanalyze and that should put those at the top. So again, it's really easy. I can straight away find out this pathogenic variant. So I find the batch search op option, one of the easiest ways to really get the most out of HGMD. And this is only available in the professional version. So as well as being able to upload a VCF file, which is what I tend to do most of all, you can also um, upload um, different file types, perhaps if you've got a list of dbSNP identifiers or a list of HGMD accession identifiers, that's also useful. And I should say that the um, there is a limit to 500 um, terms that you can do at any one time. And I could have also set my prioritization here. Um, one of the other things that's really useful and is quite a new feature in HGMD Professional is the ability to sort of limit the searching as well to certain disease types. So um, here I've been looking at low at CS syndrome, but I could have decided that I only wanted to limit my searching to heart disorders or to skin disorders. So this is quite a new feature within HGMD, but it does allow you uh, to be more specific. And this is really good, particularly if you've got a little bit of clinical information and a long list of variants. So we can start to prioritize them based on um, a, like a, a disease concept as well. So one of the other ways of getting a lot of information quickly, as well as doing the batch search, you can do an advanced search. So I will just show you that. And Again, a nice way of doing it or to show you the breadth of information available is just to put in our favorite gene and click start. And what this will do is this will return me a list of mutations and it will describe each of those mutations in detail and give you the reference from 
um, where it was originally um, uh, described. Now, these mutations are just listed here in this top table. But if I didn't want to scroll and I wanted to go and perhaps look at those splicing mutations, I could click here and then I will be taken to those splicing mutations. And I don't know if you remember, but the original table I showed you contained where we did, um, where we viewed these splicing mutations was very similar. But here we've got this extra bit of information where we can really see where all of those splice sites, um, splice site mutations sit, the location, the changes the um, substitution that's happened, as well as having the references. So this advanced search is just a, a nice way to really get um, a more broader um, range of information and summarized in a very similar, simple table format. So I hope today I've been able to show you both um, uh, with the um, academic version and the professional version, the, some of the advantages of um, using HGMD professional um, or HGMD academic in your research. Um, and I'm just going to pause here with the demo and now switch back to my slides. Well, thank you very much for watching the demo. And hopefully that's shown you in a real life scenario some of the um, points I mentioned during the um, slide um, presentation. So I'm just going to move to my next slide to summarize. So today during our, our webinar, we've looked at HGMD, both the free online academic version and the professional version. And we've been able to see how we can um, search for genes search for variants, which is really what HGMD is about. We've been we've talked about how we can use the results to design panels, how we could even have the downloadable version to improve um, our machine learning models or even to help us to understand our local population genetics in a, in a more detailed way. And I hope that um, today I've been able to give you some ideas where HGMD could help you with your own research. And if you're not sure, I would encourage you perhaps to start off with the free academic version, which you can go online now and, and have a trial at. And then if that looks of interest, then please don't hesitate to contact us. And we'd be happy to show you in more detail the professional version where you can get the most up-to-date, most relevant co um, content. Um, and certainly um, you'll be able to improve on um, the search options within the HGMD professional tool. And so I'm going to move to my last slide and finish here. And I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention today. And I'd be very happy to um, stop here and take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Burton, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, okay, please sir. do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, how frequently is the HGMD database updated? Oh, thank you. Well, that's a very good question, and it's actually updated quarterly. So you can be sure always to get the, get the latest information about your variant um, from HGMD. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burton. Let's see. We have another question. Are there any other ways of accessing HGMD other than the free or professional version? Uh, Yes, yes, there are. We um, we do have other software for interpreting variants. Um, one is called uh, Kyogen Clinical Insight um, Interpret, and that has HGMD included in in it. So if you've got a variant in your sample that's contained in HGMD, you'll see that within our QCI or interpret software, and that allows you to actually link out to HGMD um, and also um, do other things in the way of interpreting your variants, such as having the ACMG guidelines and making a clinical clinical report. So, yes, there are a couple of other options, not just having a standalone version of HGMD.
Thank you, Dr. Burton. It looks like we are out of time for today. Let's see. So thank you again, um, Dr. Ruth Burton, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Kyogen, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.